Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to this workshop. Um, just to explain a little bit where, from where I'm approaching, I'm working as an oncologist at the National Center of Tumor Disease, but only half of my time and the other time I'm heading a research group on ethics or ethical issues. Um, and um, I will report on the ethical questions that arise um, at this intersection between research and clinical care. So um, this is the, the perspective I'm approaching it, and in my talk I want to give first reasons why the new era of omics research triggers new ethical questions. One could also argue and say nothing is new in ethics, so what are the new ethical aspects or questions? Address uh, the main areas of ethical debate uh, without going into too much detail. I leave that up to you for the discussion part to pick the area that, are you, that you are most interested in, and then present first answers for best practice guidance, um, some of them draw on a platform and project that I will introduce called URAT, Ethical and Legal Aspects of Whole Genome Sequencing. Um, so start with personalized medicine. Uh, I think it's um, good to go back to the, the first ideas. Um, how it was, was portrayed, um, and it is now more recently called precision medicine. It also, also has been called or renamed systems medicine, but the original um, idea is to have all the relevant resources of information organized around each individual patient. And the, therefore, the National uh, Research Council in the US chose this analogy of Google Maps, since we had Google, Google in the introduction, it was Google Maps, as an illustration how we could think about navigating an individual patient's treatment by all the relevant data points and biomarkers, be it for prevention or treatment of disease. So I don't know whether it comes up at the back, um, um, but um, compared to Google, who kind of um, combines the different layers of information by, by good reasons, um, um, it was thought to combine all the different layers that are, might have an impact for uh, the origin of disease, but also treatment um, from an individual patient, be it uh, his exposome, so what he, his phenotype, signs and symptoms, what is the clinical world, genome, epigenome, we have heard that today, but also the microbiome, we learn that a lot more in, in recent months, um, but also individual patients' behavior and data points, and combine them so to project and pr uh, determine what this patient will be in, in a month from now or in years from now with this and that treatment. So it's a very, very ambitious analogy. And if we look at this um, different layers of information, it becomes clear that the data have their origin in quite different worlds. They originate from the research world and from the clinical world, and more and more also from the patient's daily world, say it's tracking, um, um, tracking and uh, health apps that we use. And this is, I think, new, ethically sp speaking. Not the fact that data of different resources are combined. Researchers have already, um, um, have always combined some, the, um, clinical symptoms and, and, and research data but the approach to integrate data from these different worlds, or two worlds at least, in a very structured and systematic way, and to apply means of system biology uh, to compute and uh, to analyze these data. And this is important from the points of ethics, because in, 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 if we look at our frameworks of ethics, the different world of uh, care and research are governed by quite different um, uh, frameworks and with, uh, with different uh, principles. For example, by the doctor pledged to keep his patient's data confidential and not to share them, and they don't leave any information, does not leave the um, patient-doctor room, um, re researchers are urged to share their data and make them transparent to the research community. It adds to the quality of their research and to, for other researchers to build, build on, on these data. So transparency is an asset. 
doctors are liable to good clinical practice, while researchers are responsible for their good scientific practice. So far, they are not, they are not responsible for patients nor for reporting findings out of their research back to patients or their doctors or the outcome or for changing the outcome of, for example, genomic diagnostics. So I think it is at this overlap of the two worlds where the most ethical questions arise. And if we can, if we look at the debate of the last 50 years to say, um, we can distinguish at least four main areas of debate. Uh, first is the handling of incidental findings originating from the research context. The second um, is genetic data sharing and the inherent risk of free identification, so the whole privacy issues that come up with it, um, but not only for genetic data, also for other very personal data. Um, and it all has to be communicated with the patients. We heard that um, patient, patient participation should uh, enter a new age. So how to inform on, and let pa and patients participate in decision making. Um, these, I think, the classical domains of research ethics and um, just new in their way how to address them. Um, a fourth domain that I will only touch on is more of epistemological uh, nature namely how we can prove that personalized medicine is the better medicine. How, what kind of evidence um, um, do we need to show benefits in personalized medicine? And this is the same, um, the same tools of evidence-based medicine that's, that we have developed so far. So my group is working on many of these topics, and, um, and then the, what I'm reporting today as potential practice solution is not my work. Um, and it's mainly also a work of a group in Europe that kind of gathered and came together in 2010 uh, when the next generation sequencing um, came, um, came uh, more and more widespread, uh, mainly in the research area. It's the Europe group and platform called, um, uh, stands, Europe stands, stands for Ethical and Legal Aspects of Next Generation sequencing and this uh, project brings together scholars from the life sciences. Uh, you see them on more on the left side, so from the DKFZ, uh, next generation sequencing research, genomics, um, human genetics uh, and pathology, um, um, together with uh, re uh, scholars from the normative science, which is ethics, uh, but also law. Um, and uh, we came up with kind of reports or po position on policy statements um, in 2013 and 2016 published, and this is kind of ongoing work, so-called cornerstones for an ethically and legally informed practice of whole genome sequencing. And this is not only kind of a theoretical position statement, it also encompasses very practical solutions, such as consent templates, how to communicate with the patient, and the code of contact, conduct. They are all um, on the website, and they are also there in English, so I put that with on if you are interested. And in what, what will follow now, I will touch on these four um, areas on debate and um, sketch kind of the problem and maybe also first answers. First area um, that we discussed and started discussing in 2010 was uh, that uh, with uh, whole gen genome sequencing becoming more and more uh, widespread in the research arena and approaching the clinical world, everybody expected that we find a lot more incidental findings um, in, in, if you look at the whole genome and you are interested in cancer, for example, you not only find driver mutation, whether they exist or not, <laughs> in cancer, but you find maybe also a susceptibility for here, uh, the example would be diabetes. And many of those incidental findings or additional findings that you were not looking for might have clinical utility. So it was expected uh, for the patient, at least um, if um, they were, um, 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 would, would point to treatable or preventable disease. That's the, um, the category right at the top, uh, such as hereditary, hereditary breast cancer, the Angelina Jolie example is the one uh, that comes to mind first, uh, but it also can, can point to diseases that are untreatable yet, 
your uh, degenerative diseases, muscle diseases like hun Huntington gain, uh, gene, for example, or um, other diseases in that, are in that don't affect the person himself or herself, but their offspring, like um, mucoviscidosis. And uh, the it results can indicate uh, um, different penetrance, could be high, medium, or low. So the question was, one of the first questions in the field wa was, um, how should those incidental findings be handled? Um, should they be returned even though they are generated not in a diagnostic setting? It's not a patient that, or a family coming to the doctor and saying, our child is not developing, what is the reason? It's just research participants who spend their uh, tissue for biobanking, for example. Um, so should we, should we transgress this border of research to the clinical world, or should research stay in the research field? And who, in the end, if we want to uh, return those findings, who decides about what to return? What is, what's, what is really of utility? And uh, how can this be uh, done without, um, with still respecting the right not to know, um, which has been established, especially if we look in medicine, in human genetics, to protect, um, protect people from knowledge that they cannot act upon and that might be frightened for them and uh, they um, don't, want, uh, don't want to uh, hear without being asked before. So I summarize more than I, I dis discuss the different uh, arguments uh, where the discussion is going um, at the moment. Um, and I think um, as to the first question, should results be returned? Uh, it's fair to say that the ethical debate in the last years uh, clearly shows a trend towards a yes. Uh, if the results have a high penetrance and pathogeneity and if they are uh, validated. So if they come from the research setting, they first need to be validated um, uh, in, an, in a certified lab. Uh, before they are channeled back towards the patients. A much more debate is about a second question, um, namely on who decides what results should be returned. The, dis uh, the disclosure positions range from leaving the decision to the expert, up to the professional discretion, um, um, to incorporating patient judgment about what is meaningful to them. To them. And those views depart quite a bit. If um, there was an interesting um, survey among nearly 7,000 health professionals, genomic researchers, and the public from 75 countries, and they uh, got this question um, and the following categories. Um, you see um, here the answers of geneticists in red as compared to those of the public in blue non-genetic health professionals in green and genomic researchers in, in purple. And the different categories, uh, I just read them because they are quite small here. Um, first is life-threatening can be prevented. There almost everybody um, kind of there's some consensus that you would be interested in that. Then carrier status, um, pharmacogenomics, so on medication, um, then information that could be useful later in life, for example, whether you have a tendency to, to, uh, to begin, become early short-sighted. Ancestry information, that would be this column here. Then life-threatening cannot be prevent prevented, not serious health importance and uncertain. And you see that is quite a difference how interesting the, mo the, the group that is most reluctant in uh, learning about information um, about your genome are the genetic health professionals. These are the, the, the red ones. The others, more or less, um, are on the same level interested, still interested in things that might uh, to 80% useful later in life or, uh, or life-threatening cannot be prevented. It's still up um, over 50%. Uh, and this is an in interesting observation because those professionals that would consult us um, whether to learn something or not are those who are most reluctant in conveying this information. And the reasons for that, I, we can discuss this uh, um, uh, later, might be that they are specifically paternalistic, saying what I know what you should learn about or not, 
uh, or that they have just a lot of experience in how persons react to prognostic uh, information and are therefore more reluctant. I guess just in other medical fields where value laden questions need to be made, we can here also observe a trend toward shared decision making um, which integrates professional expertise and patient values. Most important, every program I think that sequences or deals with genomic information uh, sh should uh, make it very clear up front um, what their disclosure policy is and the no disclosure policies become more and more rare. Um, EURAT, so our, our project um, suggested a kind of um, advanced directive uh, solution or a best practice way about uh, disclosure pr um, preferences. Um, we, we introduced in the patient consent process and an explanation kind of two packages uh, that we would return to patients. Uh, the first obvious package would be targeted <coughs> treatment options or preventive measures um, exist and ask the patient whether if some incidental findings would indicate a lesion that could be treated or prevented, whether they want to learn about it and the patient can say what kind of person he is, whether he would want that, yes or no, I don't want to learn about these findings. And then there is a second a uh, second question uh, and discussion about a uh, treatment option or uh, where no um, targeted um, um, sorry, um, mutations where no targeted treatment options and preventive measures exist. So that is interest introduced uh, in the, uh, in the inform information up front, although uh, there is not much detail then to the uh, specific incidental finding that might come up in the future because you don't know what you will find if you look quite broadly. So this is, this is I guess, a way to not solve the dilemma but kind of give in at least information and, and get a sense uh, what kind of information this person wants to learn later in life. This was the first area of debate. The second field of debate is data sharing and the risk of re-identification. Right, sharing sequencing data sets has become a common practice in genomics to make the best scientific use of the data um, and to generate sample sizes that allow for finding patterns, patterns and variations. The genomic data are shared um, obviously in a de-identified and coded way. Uh, however, our genetic information is unique and it, it is in principle possible to re-identify patients in omics studies. Uh, this has been not only theoretically discussed but also um, practically shown by a group of uh, around Yasef Ehrlich from the MIT um, um, who, who, who uh, write in their landmark publication um, um, that they show that a combination of surname um, with other types of metadata such as age and state uh, can be used to triangulate uh, the identity of the target, even if uh, the data have been introduced in the biobanks and the studies uh, de-identified or coded in a coded way. Using this strategy, the team was also able to confirm the identity of anonymous, anonymous research subjects, including five men who uh, participated in both the Thousand Genome Project and some of their family members. That is him. He and his schools are kind of a white hacker uh, um, group. Also showed the limitations of emerging computational techniques like encrypting for ensuring genetic privacy. So I think with this kind of limitation to the de-identification, um, it's just important that um, this, uh, uh, this argument of uh, you can spend your data but we try our best to de-identify it uh, needs to be addressed and, um, by, uh, with the patients. So we asked, uh, one asked our patients and wanted to know uh, what patients think about sharing of their genomic data. We did a systematic review of the literature and a focus group study with patients from our center, our cancer patients. In the literature, patients and um, public privacy concerns is an issue. 
uh, when it comes to genomic data. However, patients in, in, in um, our group um, had a specific special interest on information on the risk of re-identification and it was also, and they were also able to do an adequate risk benefit assessment. So it was uh, not too difficult to, to explain that to patients. Uh, my genomic data can't, um, can't be defi definitely de-identified and they were able to, to weigh the benefits of research against risk um, of triangulation of data and, and, and uh, abuse of data and uh, most of the time weighed the benefits higher than the risks. Uh, provided that institutional safeguards for risk treatment are in place, for example policies against misuse and data access committees and uh, up-to-date encryption technology. So in the Europe project, we argue that the following approach um, should, should be combined. First, we explicitly address the risk of re-identification in the patient information and make patients aware not to put their name and even a short sequence um, uh, in the internet, like uh, this has been done in many of the um, persons detected by the Ehrlich study who did ancestry research, basically. Um, and we set up a comprehensive data protection concept for genomic data for the institution in Heidelberg and their collaborators, um, basically also raising the awareness for this is issue through a co code of conduct. And here I think it's important to see that it would not be sufficient to step, stop at point one, um, point one um, just to inform the patient about the new risk and leave it to the patient to join the study or not, but we need um, when it comes to data, kind of a uh, conflict of, between data privacy and utility, we need uh, solutions that uh, address the individual and explain it very well to the patient, but we also need solutions on the governance level. So, as, uh, for example, such as a code of conduct or uh, anti-discrimination laws. Um, and this kind, so, this law would be law, but a code of conduct is an institutional answer to specific ethical challenges, so could be called soft law also, uh, below uh, jurisdiction, and that can be a first step for institutions to go, to make sure that their researchers are sensitized for uh, data, data privacy risk and handle that very carefully. So the Euro code of conduct covered, covers um, the, the issue of consent, whether the patient consented to data, sharing risk assessment of uh, the use of genomic data, a framework for protecting genomic data, and uh, the ethical issue of return of results and a process of how to channel them back uh, to the treating physician. The conduct has been, um, has, has, is binding and has been approved by the med medical faculty of the University of Heidelberg, University of itself, um, and the German Cancer Research Center. You might say, well, conduct of, code of conduct is it's kind of patients written on paper, um, but the way to go uh, to, to settle on common regulatory issues, I think, is the first important step, whether it's needed to get that into law and regulation and that is less specific to the individual institution, um, that would be to be decided on a case-by-case -case and country-by-country -country base. Just want to show you that other institutions or other, other um, platforms, for example, the, uh, the uh, Global Alliance for Genomic and Health, which is a um, framework, uh, which is a an, is an policy framing organization with more than 500 research and healthcare institutions from 71 uh, countries also goes for a framework or code of conduct for responsible sharing of genomic and health-related data, um, trying to set the stage how, how to interact for global data sharing. And although the slippery slope ar argument, if your data are out there, um, you, you never know, um, has some kind of um, uh, alarming point to it, I think with slippery slope arguments, it's always they can easily be <coughs> tested whether 
there is a slippery slope or, or not. So do we set up a regulatory uh, framework that prevents um, our uh, genome uh, data that we spend for research institutions to, to appear in the internet, or is this not successful? So that is an endeavor to make this successful. Um, the framework is built on four foundational principles, but there are also core elements for responsible data sharing, such as, um, for example, uh, and, uh, that is m more concrete and can be also looked up uh, at their website, very concrete policies um, about accountability, for example, monitoring and responding to non-compliance with data sharing standards. And this goes both ways, data sharing standards in, seen of protection, in, in the sense of protection, but also data sharing uh, standards in the sense of I don't, um, do I really share my data or do I just um, take the data protection as a kind of a window dressing argument for not, for not sharing the data that others request from me. So that is helpful. Uh, it is translated in, I think, now 17 different languages. These were the first, first nine. And it's, it's policy that can be looked up and see whether it's helpful for your institution to set up, don't reinvent the wheel. So in general, to kind of summarize this, this ethical debate about data sharing, I think in, we, have, we, we have to think in new ways to deal with the tension between patients and research interests that do not only rely on the traditional concepts of data protection and consent, um, but rather on the governance of research institutions that justifies trust on the one hand and empowerment ideas to support patient autonomy on the other hand. This means on the patient side more emphasis on trustworthy, trustworthy handling of data and the responsibility of each researcher who works with patient data, but it also means to e explore new ways of consenting patients, not only a broad consent, but maybe dynamic consent uh, ideas where the patient is recontacted or can look up in the at websites, what, is, uh, what kind of research projects are filled uh, with my data and what is uh, the outcome. And um, most importantly, maybe an honest communication about um, the expectations we can have um, from person, um, towards personalized medicine. And this is um, kind of the next issue that we had touched on in several of the talks before expectation management, I, I called it. So how, um, what does a patient expect from us when he enters the doctor's office um, from all what he heard and learned about personalized medicine so far? And patients are expecting a truly personal um, and better treatment. So a, um, they want to be treated as a person and they want to get something special that it, it's tailored to their, to, their own, uh, to their own disease and situation. And we can't deliver that in that way so far. So, so the, the way that uh, personalized medicine is practiced up to today, um, it's not so much different than the, pra the practice of medicine has always been that um, um, doctors need to treat each um, patient individually. New is that the new are the advances in genomics that allow for a stratification of patients into treatment groups according to molecular biomarkers. But so far, we don't offer the patient any very specific uh, tailored medicine, uh, and that is what the whole um, wording of personalized medicine promises to the patient. So that is, I think, um, morally uh, um, um, worthy for critique because we disappoint the patients uh, in what science, um, science explained and promised uh, to the patient. If we look uh, what the real benefit of um, personalized, personalized in, in the sense of biomarker stratified uh, treatment is so far, there are not many benefit measures that could tell us and answer this question, but at least there was one quite recent study who tried to summarize how many patients are really eligible for genome-informed treatment and how many patients benefit from that. It's all, we, again, in the cancer setting, 
metastatic cancer patients, uh, and they did a kind of um, study of all the FDA-approved uh, 38, I think, uh, uh, where genome-informed genome um, treatment uh, uh, studies and, ex um, and, and aggregated the information um, from all these studies and found out that genome-informed treatment was available, available for 15% of cancer patients, and uh, the estimated benefit of genome-informed treatment was 66.6 .6 per year um, for patients with metastatic cancer in the year 2018, and they started their analysis, this group around Marquardt um, started their analysis in 2006, where it um, was only 1.3, so it increased over the years. Um, and those, um, the, the patients that benefited, if kind of to the degree of benefit, it's also interesting to see uh, their median overall response rate for all genome-informed drugs from 2006 to 2018 uh, was uh, um, a little bit over 50%. Um, and the median, median duration of response was around 30 months in cancer patients, which sounds quite well. In, in chemo, at least chemotherapy, um, you have a similar response rate in the first line, treat, first line treatment, oftentimes around 50, 60 percent, um, but oftentimes in, um, in many cancers, not such a long response, uh, response rate, but it might seem moderate to you if you expected that this is now a very, very, very effective treatment. So for the issue of um, expectation management, I think there are at least two answers uh, to go about this. First, the wording personalized medicine is misleading. We have heard that today from several speakers. Um, it would be more honest to call what we do biomarker stratified treatment and prevention and not personalized medicine. Uh, in fact, the, the um, wording has been, um, has been kind of corrected uh, by the report 2013 already by the National Research Council. They call it precision medicine, and they really name it in correction um, to prevent uh, patients from thinking that they get tailored medicine. So precision medicine is already an, a term to correct uh, the misleading part of the personalized medicine. Precision medicine, again, s sounds a little bit very technical, only tailored to the, uh, to, to the molecules. So if we stay with truly personalized medicine, we could also think about taking that what a patient really expects uh, to, treat, to be treated as a person into the definition and then it would be precision medicine plus patient-doctor communication and empowerment, something that is even more ambitious. The second conclusion is the one uh, that the, the authors of the study themselves draw. They say, well, that's really only a moderate progress in precision oncology, and to accelerate progress, uh, we need novel trial, trial designs of genomic therapies, and they should be de developed, and broad port portfolios of drug development that should also include immunotherapeutic and cytotoxic, again, chemotherapy approaches, and they should be tested against each other. And here we arrive at the fourth, um, fourth um, uh, area of debate that is not so much research ethics, it's more about the ep epistemological basis of what knowledge means in this field because we have, this, uh, we have arrived uh, over years now at, at this paradigm of evidence-based medicine which needs in phase one to three uh, trial to, um, to generate robust knowledge um, and then um, bring it into routine care. So phase three randomized trial is kind of the old standard for approval and then bring it into routine care and only fast track for ra rare diseases get prior approval and then have uh, a phase four post-approval post uh, study to see uh, whether the expectations that the, uh, the uh, FDA had are really fulfilled. Um, with personalized medicine, if you look at the, if you remember the first picture, the whole idea was to bring all the important information from one patient 
uh, together and integrated, and that's real world data. Um, and the question is how that can be uh, still, um, whether the gold standard of, of uh, randomized fa uh, phase three uh, trials can still be, be upheld, or should even, um, or should should be. Uh, um, uh, um, sh um, and something else should be uh, put at, um, at the um, um, level of uh, 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 the evidence approval that we needed so far. And I think here is a really interesting and, and vivid debate because you have all different answers from uh, kind of traditional, yes, of course, randomized controlled trials will continue to be the strongest arbiter um, for the clinical utility of gen genomic te technologies. We can't do without. And of one trials just tell you about this only, uh, this, this one person, uh, to those who say, well, it would be nice, but it's just not feasible. We heard this uh, position today because the subgroups become ever more heterogeneous and smaller, and we can't try a uh, track combination that's all getting uh, too, um, uh, too expensive, and we just don't um, arrive at this uh, um, at such a number of trials, and we need adaptive trials designs, but they come with their own challenges. And then, still stronger opponents to old standards argue that it's it's not necessary to have group level evidence. If there is a convincing rationale for an actionable um, actionable in a me mechanistic rationale uh, that explains why, why a certain approach. Uh, will be successful, that is enough, um, even more if there are real-world data that show that there's at least one similar patient uh, case that was treated successfully. So if we look here at the, the, the data or the, the studies and evidence that we have, um, it's interesting that so far there has been only one randomized controlled trial that tried to really um, uh, compare the approach of genome-informed treatment versus standard treatment. And it has been much criticized, but I still put it up on the slide. It's called the, it's the, the study is called the Shiva study. They had only a limited number, 11, uh, per 11 um, actionable um, targets, so to say, and looked um, in and randomized the patient groups into targeted or genome-informed treating uh, treatment of the patients, but in, within this limited number of 11 different treatments versus treatment as usual, to say oncology, physician's best choice, um, and, and guideline-based treatment. And in this, in this trial, they could not show a benefit in progression-free survival was the end point um, for the targeted approach. Um, also, it was not negative, but they were even. But it was interesting that the um, the group with targeted therapy had a much higher uh, rate of uh, grade three and four toxicity and a lower quality of life than um, the group of physicians' best choice. So that was not um, kind of a convincing uh, argument for, for, uh, for uh, biomarker stratified medicine, but in, uh, in its um, upmake also criticized uh, trial, the only trial that I know of that has put those different approaches against each other and tested that. That might be, in a much larger scale, the best way to show its benefit. Meanwhile, what, what, what is done, um, and many cancer centers, uh, the so-called case-by-case um, -case decision making um, in molecular tumor boards, uh, and then a re retrospective kind of analysis to compare these cases that has been, uh, has been discussed there and treated to met in, in, in a way of matched pair analysis. Um, and here, in these retrospective studies, which are um, dif difficult always also to, uh, to, to see and to judge whether this is really an effect of the treatment, um, there was a large, uh, the, the program uh, of the MD Anderson showing that uh, almost half of the patients uh, had action, actionable mutations, and uh, out of those, 143 were treated, and their overall survival was a, a little bit better than the overall survival of the other patients who had no mutations. But that is 
in a way difficult to say whether this is really the benefit of the um, targeted treatment. In our center, we, we also discuss this a lot. We have a um, an, an very active program um, on individual patient, um, patient uh, consulting and, and tumor and exome testing um, in, at our centers uh, as of May 2018. Uh, 1,877 patients were enrolled and 1,212 patient samples could actually, actually be sequenced. Um, about 1,000 patients had been discussed in the molecular tumor board with treatment recommendations given in 8043 cases, so that makes for 82% of those who, who has been discussed. And uh, in the end, 33% 30, um, have received medication based on these recommendations. And now it's difficult to say whether, how, how really uh, they, whether and how uh, they benefited. And does this molecular stratification make sense at, and bring benefit to patients? So um, looking at overall survival is challenging because they all had different um, tumors and treatment sequences. Uh, so what our, our group um, at our center did, they compared uh, the overall response rate and the disease control rate of the patients under molecular treatment uh, compared to the chemotherapy they got before, the, li the line before, and saw that um, there is an, 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 an increase from 78 to 17% in overall response rate under targeted treatment and also the disease control rate uh, was 10% more than under conventional treatment. So you see there are different um, approaches to, to pin, pin down the benefit of uh, targeted treatment. Due to time, I skipped this one. Um, and summarize the main areas um, of debate and first answers. I first in, uh, discussed uh, the potential risk of um, or, or risk a chance of uh, incidental finding, and that we, I think, a way to go about is, is to um, to have return packages or advanced advanced poly, advanced information policies uh, to inform the patient what kind of information he would he or she would interested and in what would be offered and how that would be returned to the uh, patient. But then you also need a return process implemented and in place. Um, the potential, of, um, potential risk of re-identification need to be adequately communicated with the patient during the informed consent process, but that is not enough. You need also have a governance answer uh, of your institution to minimize risk of data misuse. Um, all this need to be uh, communicated with the patient in the informed consent process, and I think there is a, much, a lot to do to improve that, not only the templates of informed consent, but also the models to use our IT technology also to better inform our patients and not in one point in time, but over time. And I think the most challenging part um, is how to, in the end, um, 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 get the stratified treatment into practice uh, and test all the possibilities. So to accelerate progress on the one hand, but don't open the door for any direct-to-consumer test that should inform now um, whether a patient gets chemotherapy or no chemotherapy that is not really validated. So we need quality criteria for uh, precision medicine treatment applications in the end. With that, I come to an end and thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. exploit themselves 
discuss that it looks like there's some due as a result of the genome uh, data. Don't know disease, but it suggests that would be a good candidate for performance enhancement X. And then what's the obligation there? Mm. I think the it was uh, so, so um, the first the first focus was on the on the disease model, um, but we have this discussion and um, on um, and that um, um, is kind of discussed under the rubric of personal utility. Um, so, what kind of information do I uh, can I access that are just for curiosity or motivational to change my behavior, or for for improve um, for improvement, um, and I think uh, here we still see a kind of an, um, um, a, a divide between an, the disease concept and enhancement concept. Although I I, I, I see that there there is at certain points overlap. I think in the clinical uh, clinical world you would say I as a doctor and I, I think the ESCO. Uh, there's an ESCO recommendation um, what kind of uh, genome testing should be uh, ordered by oncologists and also uh, how patients should be informed how, uh, if they come to you and you didn't even order it but need to explain it. Uh, and they have an own rubric under personal curiosity or personal utility and say, well, you, you don't order that and um, you shouldn't order that, but we would first need some more um, research into how patients, or not even patients, uh, just the people uh, act upon personal utility testing. Yeah. But it was, so it was not in the focus, it was more in the background. Yes, but uh, so open, it depends on what you mean by open consent. So I think. Oh, I thought I have a microphone here. Ah, okay. Yeah. To what? To use? I didn't hear that. Either. I think they have maybe more personal. Per so can I, should I answer the question? <laughs> so um, I don't know whether the, the, um, the uh, comparison with Facebook, Facebook is so helpful because there the, the persons have a direct utility which they don't have if they spend their tumor, tumor tissue to, to, to some research projects. No, we, we di discussed open consent. Uh, what we have is a broad consent uh, with restricted access and restricted to researchers. And I think most of the, um, most of the um, international genome collaboration projects, they left open consent and went to at least some restriction. You need to authenticate, so it's, it's, it's true for ECGC, it's true for the Global Alliance. You, um, due to also the Jan F. Ehrlich, um, results um, to put it just in open databases uh, makes it more accessible for anyone. Um, and that uh, kind of, uh, um, there it seems that in restricted access where you still need to authenticate that you are a researcher and not just somebody who is looking into other, other people's genome for other curiosity reasons is a good, uh, good way of balancing um, utility and, and privacy. I think I would say most of the projects left open consent and, 
and went to not not in very restricted, but, but some restrictions um, to to access genomes, which does not mean that the patient is not open to support research and say, uh, you can do whatever you want with you, with my data. Um, I just want that those who do something with the data uh, need to authenticate as researchers. So that was our discussion. I hear you. Well, that's um, that's an interesting question. I I um, I I think I can't. There's no study or qualitative study on, on geneticists how they view it that would give us more information, what their reasons are behind how they answered this quantitative survey. But I think um, one reason might be their experience, how they how they in their professional life experience how how people deal with. Uh, preventive or prognostic information, and that they are thus therefore more more uh, reluctant. We had one, the chair of our um, genetics department is part of the UAT group, and he was also the most restrictive in telling, telling and explaining or informing patients or just give, writing them a letter. This is this and that are your uh, genetic mutations, and say that's. Uh, that, that there needs to be much more sophisticated explanation and there needs to be a counseling process um, before and after to, to deal with the information. Um, but others say, well, they, that's their professional deformation. Uh, um, just put it on the internet and learn. If you're cur curious, you can learn about your genomes. So I, I don't have a final answer to that. There's one yeah. question in the back. Mm -hmm. So 
I understand, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, I, I think that's, that's the case that informed consent in a really informed way is kind of an ideal. And it's not, it's, we are not even close, even in very simple, simple situations, if of its, whether it's a surgical procedure or standard chemotherapy or in phase three trial, most patients have the misconception, or phase one, two trial, have the misconception that this is treatment and not an experiment in a way, and that their chances for, for benefiting is much higher than, than it's the average benefit that you have in phase one, two trial. So that is known for 20 years now. But it's also known for 20 years that our informed consent doc documents and information process is just made to, to back up the legal part and not written in a way so that patient can understand it. It's, it's, it's um, uh, most, most uh, patients with a ninth grader level don't understand what we write there. It's academics writing for academics. So I think it's neither nor, it's not uh, because um, only because it's not that easy that we should give up the ideal, uh, and and in our f and and there are um, consent uh, trials that uh, worked with uh, easier language, and, and that is what we tried with our focus group. We went with the patients through um, through the issues that I also so the incidental findings, the de-identification is. So it's not that difficult to explain what it's at stake, and that that is at least a risk. And then there was a very vivid discussion, and patients came up on different sides um, in, in the group. So it's not impossible to, to explain the issue in, in clear language, and then uh, uh, leave it to the patient to make a decision. But the interesting part is, what I, I observed is that the patients make a very good calculation of kind of, yes, there is a risk, but there's also a risk if I pay with my credit card with the data, and this, this risk, we are, we, or if I use my Facebook account, so they calculate the risk and uh, more or less say, well, but this is now a valuable goal and I take the risk. And some say, no, I don't do that, but it would be important to inform them in the first place. And it seems to be that it's more the information material, but also the process of informing, kind of to have more points in time where you can come back and ask questions that is important, or to have a study nurse and not an, a busy doctor to, to explain it. And this is what we are working on. So we have now, uh, next step would be to have a randomized trial with, um, with material and, and uh, little explore, explicatory videos versus standard uh, informed consent procedure and see whether that makes any delta, whether the patients are better informed. But I, on the other hand, I think if we just invest a little bit of the money that we invest in, 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 in the research, also in how to better inform patients. Um, I think it's just a field that has, has been quite neglected. It's always there participatory in the P4 medicine, but in the end, um, that is the part that has no funding whatsoever. <laughs>